the most dangerous superstition. Mark Rose 2011, Mark Rose Preparing the Reader What you read in this book will, in all likelihood, go directly against what you have been taught by your parents and your teachers, what you have been told by the churches, the media and the government, and much of what you, your family and your friends have always believed. Nonetheless, it is the truth, as you will see if you allow yourself to consider the issue objectively. Not only is it the truth, it also may be the most important truth you will ever hear. More and more people are discovering this truth, but to do so, it is necessary to look past many preconceived assumptions and deeply ingrained superstitions, to set aside one's lifelong indoctrination, and to examine some new ideas fairly and honestly. If you do this, you will experience a dramatic change in how you view the world. It will almost certainly feel uncomfortable at first, but in the long run it will be well worth the effort. And if enough people choose to see this truth, and embrace it, not only will it drastically change the way those people see the world, it will drastically change the world itself, for the better. But if such a simple truth could change the world, wouldn't we all already know about it? And wouldn't we have put it into practice long ago? If humans were purely a race of thinking, objective beings, yes. But history shows that most human beings would literally rather die than objectively reconsider the belief systems they were brought up in. The average man who reads in the newspaper about war, oppression and injustice will wonder why such pain and suffering exists, and will wish for it to end. However, if it is suggested to Rum that his own beliefs are contributing to the misery, he will almost certainly dismiss such a suggestion without a second thought, and may even attack the one making the suggestion. So, reader, if your beliefs and superstitions many of which you did not choose for yourself, but merely inherited as unquestioned hand-me-down beliefs matter to you more than truth and justice, then please stop reading now and give this book to someone else. If, on the other hand, you are willing to question some of your long-held preconceived notions if doing so might reduce the suffering of others, then read this book, and then give it to someone else. Part I The Most Dangerous Superstition Starting with the punchline How many millions have gazed upon the brutal horrors of history, with its countless examples of man's inhumanity to man, and wondered aloud how such things could happen. The truth is, most people wouldn't want to know how it happens, because they themselves are religiously attached to the very belief that makes it possible. The vast majority of suffering and injustice in the world, today and spanning back thousands of years, can be directly attributed to a single idea. It is not greed or hatred, or any of the other emotions or ideas that are usually blamed for the evils of society. Instead, most of the violence, theft, assault and murder in the world is the result of a mere superstition, a belief which, though almost universally held, runs contrary to all evidence and reason. Though, of course, those who hold the belief do not see it that way. The punchline of this book is easy to express, albeit difficult for most people to accept, or even to calmly and rationally contemplate. The belief in authority, which includes all belief in government, is irrational and self-contradictory. It is contrary to civilization and morality, and constitutes the most dangerous, destructive superstition that has ever existed. Rather than being a force for Order and justice, the belief in authority is the archenemy of humanity. Of course, nearly everyone is raised to believe the exact opposite, that obedience to authority is a virtue, at least in most cases, that respecting and complying with the laws of government is what makes us civilized, and that disrespect for authority 
leads only to chaos and violence. In fact, people have been so thoroughly trained to associate obedience with being good that attacking the concept of authority will sound, to most people, like suggesting that there is no such thing as right and wrong, no need to abide by any standards of behavior, no need to have any morals at all. That is not what is being advocated here quite the opposite. Indeed, the reason the myth of authority needs to be demolished is precisely because there is such a thing as right and wrong, it does matter how people treat each other, and people should always strive to live moral lives. Despite the constant authoritarian propaganda claiming otherwise, having respect for authority and having respect for Humanity are mutually exclusive and diametrically opposed. The reason to have no respect for the myth of authority is so that we can have respect for humanity and justice. There is a harsh contrast between what we are taught is the purpose of authority, to create a peaceful, civilized society, and the real world results of authority in action. Flip through any history book and you will see that most of the injustice and destruction that has occurred throughout the world was not the result of people breaking the law, but rather the result of people obeying and enforcing the laws of various governments. The evils that have been committed in spite of authority are trivial compared to the evils that have been committed in the name of authority. Nevertheless, children are still taught that peace and justice come from authoritarian control and that, despite the flagrant evils committed by authoritarian regimes around the world throughout history, they are still morally obligated to respect and obey the current government of their own country, they are taught that doing as you're told is synonymous with being a good person, and that playing by the rules is synonymous with doing the right thing. On the contrary, being a moral person requires taking on the personal responsibility of judging right from wrong and following one's own conscience. The opposite of respecting and obeying authority. The reason it is so important that people understand this fact is that the primary danger posed by the myth of authority is to be found not in the minds of the controllers in government but in the minds of those being controlled, one nasty individual who loves to dominate others is a trivial threat to humanity unless a lot of other people view such domination as legitimate because it is achieved via the laws of government. The twisted mind of Adolf Hitler, by itself, posed little or no threat to humanity. It was the millions of people who viewed Hitler as authority and thus felt obligated to obey his commands and carry out his orders, who actually caused the damage done by the third. Reek. In other words, the problem is not that evil people believe in authority, the problem is that basically good people believe in authority, and as a result, end up advocating and even committing acts of aggression, injustice and oppression, even murder. The average statist, one who believes in government, while lamenting all the ways in which authority has been used as a tool for evil, even in his own country, will still insist that it is possible for government to be a force for good, and still imagine that authority can and must provide the path to peace and justice. People falsely assume that many of the useful and legitimate things that benefit human society require the existence of government. It is good, for example, for people to organize for mutual defense, to work together to achieve common goals, to find ways to cooperate and get along peacefully, to come up with agreements and plans that better allow human beings to exist and thrive in a mutually beneficial and non-violent state of civilization, but that is not what government is. Despite the fact that governments always claim to be acting on behalf of the people and the common good, the truth is that government, by its very nature, is always in direct opposition to the interests of mankind. Authority is not a noble idea that sometimes goes wrong, nor is it a basically valid concept that is sometimes corrupted. From top to bottom, 
from start to finish, the very concept of authority itself is anti-human and horribly destructive. Of course, most people will find such an assertion hard to swallow. Isn't government an essential part of human society? Isn't it the mechanism by which civilization is made possible, because it forces us imperfect humans to behave in an orderly, peaceful manner? Isn't the enacting of common rules and laws what allows us to get along, to settle disputes in a civilized manner, and to trade and otherwise interact in a fair, non-violent way? Haven't we always heard that if not for the rule of law and a common respect for authority, we would be no better than a bunch of stupid, violent beasts living in a state of perpetual conflict and chaos? Yes, we have been told that. And no, none of it is true. But trying to disentangle our minds from age-old lies, trying to distill the truth out of a jungle of deeply entrenched falsehoods, can be exceedingly difficult, not to mention uncomfortable. Overview In the following pages the reader will be taken through several stages, in order to fully understand why the belief in authority truly is the most dangerous superstition in the history of the world. First, the concept of authority will be distilled down to its most basic essence, so it can be defined and examined objectively. In part two, it will be shown that the concept itself is fatally flawed, that the underlying premise of all government is utterly incompatible with logic and morality. In fact, it will be shown that government is a purely religious belief of faith-based acceptance of a superhuman, mythological entity that has never existed and will never exist. The reader is not expected to accept such a startling claim without ample evidence and sound reasoning, which will be provided. In part 3, it will be shown why the belief in authority, including all belief in government, is horrendously dangerous and destructive. Specifically, it will be shown how the belief in authority dramatically impacts both the perceptions and the actions of various categories of people, leading literally billions of otherwise good, peaceful people to condone or commit acts of violent, immoral aggression. In fact, everyone who believes in government does this, though the vast majority does not realize it, and would vehemently deny it. Finally, in part 4, the reader will be given a glimpse into what life without the belief in authority could look like. Contrary to the usual assumption that an absence of government would mean chaos and destruction, it will be shown that when the myth of authority is abandoned, much will change, but much will also stay the same. It will be shown why, rather than the belief in government being conducive to and necessary for a peaceful society, as nearly everyone has been taught, the belief is by far the biggest obstacle to mutually beneficial organization, cooperation, and peaceful coexistence. In short, it will be shown why true civilization can and will exist only after the myth of authority has been eradicated. Identifying the enemy To assess the concept of authority and determine its worth, we must begin by clearly Defining what it means, and what it is. From early childhood we are taught to submit to the will of authority, to obey the edicts of those who, in one way or another, have acquired positions of power and control from the beginning. The goodness of a child is graded, whether explicitly or implicitly, first by how well he obeys his parents, then by how well he obeys his teachers, and then by how well he obeys the laws of government. Whether implied or stated, society is saturated with the message that obedience is a virtue, and that the good people are the ones who do what authority tells them to do. As a result of that message, the concepts of morality and obedience have become so muddled in most people's minds that any attack on the notion of authority will, to most people, feel like an attack on morality itself. Any suggestion that government is inherently illegitimate will sound like suggesting that 
everyone should behave as uncaring, vicious animals, living life by the code of survival of the fittest. The trouble is that the average person's belief system rests upon a hodgepodge of vague, often contradictory, concepts and assumptions. Terms such as morality and obedience, laws and legislatures, leaders and citizens are used constantly by people who have never rationally examined such concepts. The first step in trying to understand the nature of Authority, or government, is to define what the word means, what is this thing called? Government. Government tells people what to do. But that by itself does not give us a sufficient definition, because all sorts of individuals and organizations tell others what to do. Government, however, does not simply suggest or request, it commands, but an Advertiser who says act now, or a preacher who tells his congregation what to do could also be said to be giving commands, but they are not government. Unlike the commands of preachers and advertisers, the commands of government are backed by the threat of punishment, the use of force against those who do not comply, those who are caught breaking the law. But even that does not give us a complete definition because street thugs and bullies also enforce their commands, but they are not government. The distinguishing feature of authority is that it is thought to have the right to give and enforce commands. In the case of government, its commands are called laws, and disobeying them is called crime. Authority can be summed up as the right to rule. It is not merely the ability to forcibly control others which to some extent nearly everyone possesses. It is the supposed moral right to forcibly control others. What distinguishes a street gang from government is how they are perceived by the people they control the trespasses, robbery, extortion, assault and murder committed by common thugs are perceived by almost everyone as being immoral, unjustified, and criminal. Their victims may comply with their demands but not out of any feeling of moral obligation to obey, merely out of fear. If the intended victims of the street gang thought they could resist without any danger to themselves, they would do so, without the slightest feeling of guilt. They do not perceive the street thug to be any sort of legitimate, rightful ruler, they do not imagine him to be authority. The loot the thug collects is not referred to as taxes, and his threats are not called laws. The demands and commands of those who wear the label of government, on the other hand, are perceived very differently by most of those at whom the commands are aimed. The power and control the lawmakers in government exert over everyone else is seen as valid and legitimate, legal and good. Likewise, most who comply with such commands by obeying the law, and who hand over their money by paying taxes, do not do so merely out of fear of punishment if they disobey, but also out of a feeling of duty to obey. No one takes pride in being robbed by a street gang, but many wear the label of law-abiding taxpayer as a badge of honor. This is due entirely to how the obedient perceive the ones giving them commands. If they are perceived as authority, a rightful master, then by definition they are seen as having the moral right to give such commands, which in turn implies a moral obligation on the part of the people to obey those commands. To label oneself a law-abiding taxpayer is to brag about one's loyal obedience to government. In the past, some churches have claimed the right to punish heretics and other sinners, but in the Western world today, the concept of authority is almost always linked to government. In fact, the two terms can now be used almost synonymously, since, in this day and age, each implies the other, authority supposedly derives from the laws enacted by government, and government is the organization imagined to have the right to rule, that is, authority. It is essential to differentiate between a command being justified based upon the situation and being justified based upon who gave the command. Only the latter is the type of 
authority being addressed in this book, though the term is occasionally used in another sense which tends to muddle this distinction. When, for example, someone asserts that he had the authority to stop a mugger to get an old lady's purse back, or says he had the authority to chase trespassers off his property, he is not claiming to possesses any special rights that others do not possess. He is simply saying that he believes that certain situations justify giving orders or using force. In contrast, the concept of government is about certain people having some special right to rule. And that idea, the notion that some people as a result of elections or other political rituals, for example have the moral right to control others, in situations where most people would not, is the concept being addressed here. Only lose in government are thought to have the right to enact laws, only they are thought to have the right to impose taxes, only they are thought to have the right, wage wars, to regulate certain matters, to grant licenses for various activities, and oh on, when the belief in authority is discussed in this book, that is the meaning being referred to, the idea that some people have the moral right to forcibly control others, and that, consequently, those others have the moral obligation to obey. It should be stressed that authority is always in the eye of the beholder, if the one being controlled believes that the one controlling him has the right to do so, then the one being controlled sees the controller as authority. If the one being controlled does not perceive the control to be legitimate, then the controller is not viewed as authority but is seen simply as a bully or a thug. The tentacles of the belief in authority reach into every aspect of human life, but the common denominator is always the perceived legitimacy of the control it exerts over others. Every law and tax, federal, state and local, every election and campaign, every license and permit, every political debate and movement. In short, everything having to do with government, from a trivial town ordinance to a world war rests entirely upon the idea that some people have acquired the moral right, in one way or another, to one degree or another to rule over others. The issue here is not just the misuse of authority or an argument about good government versus bad government, but an examination of the fundamental underlying concept of authority. Whether an authority is seen as absolute or as having conditions or limits upon it may have a bearing on how much damage that authority does, but it has no bearing on whether the underlying concept is rational. The, the United States Constitution, for example, is imagined to have created an authority which, at least in theory, had a severely restricted right to rule. Nonetheless, it still sought to create an authority with the right to do things, for example, tax and regulate, which the average citizen has no right to do on his own, though it pretended to give the right to rule only over certain specific matters, it still claimed to bestow some authority upon a ruling class, and as such, is just as much a target of the following criticism of authority as the authority of a supreme dictator would be. The term authority is sometimes used in ways that have nothing to do with the topic of this book. For example, one who is an expert in some field is often referred to as an authority. Likewise, some relationships resemble authority but do not involve any right to rule. The employer-employee relationship is often viewed as if there is a boss and an underling. However, no matter how domineering or overbearing an employer may be, he cannot conscript workers, or imprison them for disobedience. The only power he really has is the power to terminate the arrangement by firing the employee, and the employee has the same power, because he can quit. The same is true of other relationships that may resemble authority, such as a craftsman and his apprentice, a martial arts sensei and his pupil, or a trainer and the athlete he trains. Such scenarios 
involve arrangements based upon mutual, voluntary agreement, in which either side is free to opt out of the arrangement. Such a relationship, where one person allows another to direct his actions in the hopes that he will benefit from the other's knowledge or skill, is not the type of authority that constitutes the most dangerous superstition, if it constitutes authority at all.